Once upon a time, a mythical king of Egypt, Themis, refused to accept the gift of writing as he feared that it would make his subjects forgetful. This led to a conflict between him and the god of invention, who was the one offering him the gift of writing. Over the course of time, the latter prevailed, and today he has a large number of followers, who are moved by his spirit and are known as technophiles. Technophiles have invented countless other novelties and in a good number of cases, without amply justifying their need in the first place. At such a juncture, an ardent devotee of the Egyptian king rose up to the dais and challenged the prevailing sentiment of worshipping technology, which eventually got him labelled as a technophobe. So what exactly is the clash over technology about? Welcome to Bookmark, and today we are going to discuss Technopoly, the Surrender of Culture to Technology by Neil Postman. So your introductory remarks, Adarsh, I think they are uh, more or less taken from the very first chapter. In fact, the first paragraph itself of, of the book, in which the author uh, is talking about the naive optimism of technophiles. And uh, what I found about this book, uh, especially uh, interesting and uh, laudatory, is the fact that the way in which the author has uh, objectively described the new world of technopoly uh, and almost resigned to that fate, like mm -hmm. saying that this is bound to happen. Right. But here is how you can, you know, individually make that uh, make a distinction between the world and yourself to keep yourself safe, to keep your sanity in this ever maddening world. And uh, what he says in the very first chapter in, in that, uh, in, in alluding to the technophiles is that technological progress, uh, the reasons for technological progress are quite compelling uh, because it's almost like a, longing of the human nature itself that expresses itself in the evolution of technology. Uh, and while those reasons are very obvious and everyone understands it, not everyone understands the second order consequences of what happens when a new technology arrives in the market, so to speak. Uh, and those second order con consequences are the blind spots in our collective thinking, which uh, completely transform the world and then we, as a culture, as a society, we find ourselves to be disarmed and uh, completely at a loss at how to deal with the new, the new world, the brave new world. So, he says somewhere that technophiles only recognize what technology can do, not what it can undo. Right. I think that's a profound statement. Uh, and just to read between the lines, what I get from that... Uh, you know, from this narrative of his, is that the truth about technology is so grim that most people uh, don't look at it uh, because they don't have a high truth preference. They just want to get on with their lives and find the conveniences good enough for survival. And uh, they tend to overlook or ignore uh, the, the other side so that they can maintain a functional optimism in their lives. What do you think? So, uh the first thing that I liked about the book is that uh, the author confesses to be a technophobe. I mean, he just gets away with all sorts of name calling. Like You can call me any names, but le let's first take the argument for the sake of the argument. Now, uh, the point is that also it mentioned that it's, it's, this is not some sort of an activism for uh, uh, going back to the hunter-gatherer era. Hmm. Like whenever you talk about, uh, it, you label someone as technophile. So as one will say that everybody is technophile since we too are con having conversation and looking at these gadgets. We are also a technophile in those terms and we are not uh, demanding everyone to let's go back to where we came from and stone everything age. will be stone age, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Live like hunter gatherers and all. So the book doesn't go that way but the book uh, questions the very basic of the need of invention and that itself hits at the very uh, root of the modern mind. When a modern mind encounters a subject uh, or let's say when we talk about people who have made big in life, we talk about how Thomas Alva Edison had thousand inventions, uh, how 
uh, Steve Jobs created an empire out of nothing or whatever it is. So we motivate our next generation to invent or to experiment things. Here, the book begins with the story of a god who is receiving an invention and is refusing to, sorry, uh, a king who is re refusing to receive an invention. From the god of invention. Right, from the god of invention. Now, that's a very classical uh, dilemma of the king that when the problem is already solved, why do you need a, a new tool to solve which has already have been solved? Mm -hmm. and there's no purpose to it. Mm -hmm. That's not how a modern mind thinks. Mm -hmm. The modern mind will be dazzled by this invention and say, okay, till now we had to memorize all of it. Now we have something that we can write and we'll keep it uh, preserved for generations to come, even mm -hmm. if a catastrophe might unfold. So. One side may say that, okay, I am the one who is far-sighted. Mm. I am the one who is looking beyond your 5-10 uh, years uh, of life, what will pass on or not. Suppose a catastrophe happens and in today's time when we are, uh, we are just living in the aftermath of a COVID pandemic, which was very uncertain. One will say that we should invent more, we should go more towards the technological progress uh, because we don't know what may happen. So we must be capable enough to fight any kind of a nat uh, natural or artificial crisis. Yeah. Oh. So th there is a classical uh, uh, fight between the two. One is one thinks that he's more prepared. So technology is empowering. The power of technology has boosted him so much uh, his confidence or his uh, belief that he can overcome any any disaster if he's technologically advanced. And right. that's what you have heard in all science fiction films that we have watched or the right. literature that we read. So this book basically challenges that route to begin right. with. Um, and not just that, what I found uh, very well addressed is also the fact that, uh, I mean, similar to the comments that I made earlier, right. about how technology, when it is introduced, how new technology, mm -hmm. after getting introduced, creates uh, a new world Correct. altogether. So he says somewhere, I don't know if it's in the first chapter or later, but he says something to the, he compares it with an ecological yeah. or an ecosystem. In the first chapter itself. Uh, in the, he compares it with an ecosystem that when you introduce a new species into mm -hmm. an ecosystem, you don't just, uh, you know, like for example, he talk, takes the uh, case of caterpillars. So he says, if in an ecosystem you introduce caterpillars, the new ecosystem is not ecosystem plus caterpillar. Correct. It is a wholly new ecosystem where the conditions of survival have been uh, redefined. Sure. Similarly, when you apply technology to a culture, what comes out of it is not the old culture plus new technology, but it's a totally new culture. The statement is technological change is neither additive or sub nor subtractive. It is ecological. And uh, we can see it from the example. So one more thing that we should mention, uh, which you mentioned in the first chapter itself, that this book was written in the in the aftermath of the first uh, of the Gulf War of 1990s. Okay. So that was the first war which was televised. Right. On uh, prime time, and you can see all of that. And the world first time saw the power of. They have seen the power of defense and military, and at a moment everything had been there before. But the power of television to drive a certain narrative and to drive people towards a certain uh, mission. Let's say all together, and mm. the world is hooked on to what's happening in Iraq. Yeah. And it changed the mindset. It definitely changed the mindset. And now that we are uh, in 2024, like almost three decades later, we have seen internet. At that time, internet wasn't wasn't even a big thing. It was just in a, its uh, budding phases. We have seen how technology has altered the very nature and our very understanding of interaction. Uh, the very when we mentioned that uh, the very understanding of a community has been changed. Mm. The social media is the new community. This was something which was unthinkable when this book was written. Right. right so right. Uh, it definitely comes out as true that one technological advancement between the time the book was written and the time when we are reading this book, one technological advancement has altered everything. Correct. Our very basic notions of uh, of a person to person interaction has been changed. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, the, the, I mean, there are several other books also on this subject. Um, of how the television changed the nature of politics in America right. and eventually the whole world. Uh, and how earlier when there was no TV, politics was more uh, concerned with local issues, right. with communities and with getting real things done. Right. And when TV came into the picture, suddenly what is happening a thousand kilometers away from you becomes relevant to you in your bedroom. 
and you are more concerned about the state of your the park or or the river or the pond next door then uh, you are less concerned you're less concerned about what is happening in the immediate surroundings right. as opposed to what is happening a thousand uh, kilometers right. away so that itself uh, i think it was president ronald reagan who first identified that um, the nature of that medium and completely transformed his own his way of doing politics so to speak so so there are several other books and he also touches upon this fact and he says that technology tends to create new meanings for older words and sometimes coins altogether new words right. and in uh, and in doing so you know things like freedom truth wisdom knowledge all these words acquire a new, new meaning altogether meaning when uh, technology like tv comes into right. the picture so he also uh, then mentions about the root of the technological optimism hmm. what do you have something to say about that so he mentions three things uh, before the root he mentions the three eras that's very interesting because okay. uh, countless historians have defined history uh, divided history as per their own understanding different era we also talk about stone age then we talk about uh, bronze age and so right. on so forth different yeah he talks about three eras first is the uh, tool using cultures now when we talk about tool using culture I, our mind straight away goes back to 500 uh, uh, bc or 1000 bc and when people were primarily dependent on tools but no for him the tool using cultures uh, are up till the medieval ages okay like even when the windmills were being made they were primarily a tool using culture they invented from one tool to another as per the need of uh, as per their own need and their own right. understanding uh, i was read i was reading uh, a blog last year by a friend who actually mentioned about how china invented a lot of uh, uh, technological innovations in 12th century mm -hmm. before their eventual decline due to bureaucratic reasons whatever they were, they were that was a different thing but they did invent a lot so did india i mean we have we right. still talk about uh, how many inventions have happened in the past so what he says that uh, in even 1280 when the eye uh, spectacles that we wear the eye glasses were made in uh, italy maybe uh, that was also a product of a tool using culture mm. it was only in 1561 so somewhere around after 16th century that the second era comes and that is the era of technocracies this mm. is still not the era of technology this is right. a era be between a tool using and a technopolitic mm. culture and he says that the uh, francis bacon was the first uh, person mm. who was you can say the first man of technocratic age mm. and he refers that the principal aim of bacon's work or the bacon's philosophy was to was that what uh, what is the need of technology and he said the happiness of mankind it is to advance the work of happiness of mankind so he said uh and he criticized his predecessors to fall, predecessors to falling to understand the real and legitimate goal of sciences which is endowment of human life with new invention and riches so he said that we are just not inventing to solve local problems we are inventing to ensure a better life or what we today mm. know as a quality of living is being given mm. to uh, people across uh, across the globe and that is the power that a huma human mind must unleash so as to make a better world mm -hmm. and that somehow altered the notion of people not the individual but the technologies that started mm -hmm. evolving over the course of time and he said the till up till the industrial revolution mm -hmm. the notion had uh, set in mm -hmm. that the purpose is to ensure a better life for human beings so those technologies primarily solved the individual comfort and the idea of how much happiness can an individual get from those technologies now again it may be an abstract term to say what is happiness and someone may come up with a different philosophy but in this sense the happiness is directly related to comfort mm -hmm. how comfortably you can uh, sit at your own place and access things that for which you must have had to do hard labor at one point of time now it's accessible to you so when uh, goods are being produced on large scale and it's getting accessible to all you need not to rush to a uh, shop and do hard labor earn some money and then buy the th those things no we right. can cut the process down and we can ensure the human mind can be put into some better use maybe right. 
Right. That's the sort of philosophy that altered the new age. Yeah. And then came the technopoly era, where machines started inventing machines. You know, uh, to the point that you are making one machine based on another machine, mm. and you are just enhancing the uh, what do you call the collective output of it. When uh, the efficiency, where the mm. efficiency takes over. Okay, we are making comfort, but now we need something which is super efficient, mm. uh, which surpasses all boundaries. And he says that that era uh, somewhere came around 1776 and later after that era when the uh, American nation started coming up uh, and the wealth of nations by Adam Smith and that philosophy altogether changed. And the market economy actually took over the whole world. That is some. That is how he has uh, differentiated the three uh, right, eras right. of humanity. So basically a tool using culture is a culture where uh, tools are invented to serve specific purposes and uh, they are very well embedded in the culture. Their logic uh, and their use, their utility uh, is derived from the culture in which they are produced. Uh, technocracy is where tools uh, have been invented for the sake of invent invention, for, for the sake of novelty. Uh, for the sake of novelty. For the idea that it can give you comfort. Right. So, so, uh, later on in the book, uh, he makes uh, the comparison between a technopoly and a technocracy. Uh -huh. A technocracy is where the tools start dominating the culture as opposed to the culture. Uh, it, it's still in the middle way. Yeah, but but it's already dominating. dominating the culture. But technopoly is he uses, a complete takeover. Yeah, he uses an interesting phrase. He says that technopoly is a totalitarian technocracy. Hmm. So that I think is how the three uh, stages of right. this development are uh, defined by him. Uh, what I was referring to was in the first chapter he refers to this technological optimism of the masses, right? And and he says that technological optimism is basically a function of three things. Right. One is democratic ethos. Right. Second is weak traditions. And third is actually a product of this, that it is a high res res receptivity to new tech. Okay. So, uh, it's very interesting that, you know, how democracy uh, also leads to a weakness, weak weakening of traditions. Okay. And how both of these two combined make uh, people yearn for new technology all the time. Okay. So, this is a very, um, very deep point that he makes. I think that Eventually, in the course of the discussion, we can, you know, uh, flesh it out a little more. Uh, now, what he says is that every tool uh, actually has an ideological bias. Uh, and he quotes that famous, he you know, mentions the famous quote that of Marshall McLuhan, uh, which is the medium is the message. Actually, I never figured it out before, uh, before reading this book, what this phrase really meant. meant yeah now but now i'm quite clear by courtesy uh, uh, postman <laughs> that when <clears throat> the new technology when a new technology comes it mm. displaces the old one and it creates an entire uh, institutional setup around it to further its uh, propagation right mm. and those institutions are only meant to propagate this technology right. and through that, it basically, uh, you know, it competes with the old technology for time, money, attention, uh, prestige, uh, and for the dominance of the worldview, right? How the technologies differ in their implication on the worldview of the people. And these institutions, because it, their whole survival is based on the technology, they push for the new technology and they create conditions that completely make the older technology outdated and irrelevant and that's how new technology completely takes over and changes everything the the kind of um, exponential change that we were just talking about and so in that way the you know the the medium is the message because it the the bias the ideological bias is deeply embedded in the very tools that you are bringing in correct so that's an interesting one that making it completely irrelevant uh, leaves any room for any clash. Like once it has given you a certain kind of power or the institutions that are built around it are serving that power itself. Hmm. That the, which is the technology have given them in the first place. 
so what were what was before that that the ecological change that has happened so that becomes completely irrelevant what was before that ecological change mm -hmm. and therefore there was there's no room for any conversation at all yeah yeah and that's the success of technocracies true so uh, going back to you know the uh, i mean focusing on the chapter 2 which is from tools to technocracy right um here he actually talks about the difference between i mean he goes into more detail about mm -hmm. how tool using cultures differ from technocracies and he is talking about uh, this quality or this attribute of tool using cultures where what technology uh, must be employed and what technology must be developed is subservient to the elaborate rules and rituals uh, of the culture that it is these rules and rituals that specify how and to what end a tool could be used and so the tools are not really intruders they are integrated into the culture in ways that do not pose a significant threat to the world view of that culture so uh, like he also mentions one thing that uh, an interesting paragraph that both plato and aristotle scorned at the base mechanic arts right and probably the belief that nobility of mind was not enhanced by efforts to increase efficiency or productivity right efficiency and productivity were, were problems for slaves not philosophers okay <laughs> correct so basically that uh, for a, this is a greek culture ancient cultures yeah. that's quite uh, profound about that that they were not interested in these uh, basic things of making one machine to another machine because that's not something that the philosophers are going to mm. be dealing with that's something that people who are actually putting their work they are uh, meant to solve mm. and they will solve it on their own uh, that is something that they have invented and there's something that they will keep on uh, inventing so as to sort the basic problem the problem which is right there in front of them mm. that is not not something which is going there they are saying that we'll solve in the third and the fourth order consequence of it right right, right. i'll invent this as something which will, will be invented of this because yeah. of this principle right, right and that will be applicable on those masses which yeah we are it's completely yeah, abstract yeah, yeah. like today we are planning to uh, settle on mars right. let's say correct now we need to create certain technologies those technologies will, will create a different kind of a world and Absolutely. then we can just transport our entire community to a different world yeah. that's not how any of the ancient culture ever thought yeah but one may say that that's why the ancient cultures perished and <laughs> we are not going to perish that's the technological optimism one may come yeah. up with yeah no the thing is that in a uh, so uh, between the a tool using culture and a technocracy a tool using culture we have defined is how they right. i mean they they have a strict do's and don't sort of list correct for how a technology has to be used or developed in a technocracy tools play that central role uh and they play a central role in the thought culture of uh thought world of that culture and uh, in some sense tools become the culture right uh so the roots of modern technocracies that uh, postman describes are very interesting one the first one is the mechanical clock right. which changed the conception of time because till then people used to uh, conceptualize time uh, in terms of season in terms of uh, how the natural ebb and flow uh, maybe of tides or how the sun rises the sun sets where the birds are flowing so your biological clock was really uh, very well attuned with the natural clock or the outside uh, ebb and flow of time but the mechanical clock suddenly changed that so it was one profound shift in the conception of time the second is the printing press and the printing press uh, changed the epistemology of oral traditions and it and the new technology of writing which is the classic case of a famous uh, you know refusing and refuse <laughs> refusing that uh, and what that did is especially well pronounced in our own culture right, right? where uh, today's debate seems so meaningless when when they talk about um, uh, you know accessibility to vedas vedas and things like that because the vedic transmission of knowledge was an oral tradition right. and it it had very different uh, rules and regulations for the reasons for the similar reasons that we've just mentioned i mean uh, there's I'll also just let me i'll just yeah. finish and the third he defines is the telescope 
because as we know it is the closest in time to us and it completely destroyed the fundamental propositions of the judeo christian theology correct so these are the three things i think this is so well uh, defined and you know it's clear milestones in the progress from a tool making to a technocracy technocratic culture on uh, on that uh, veda point the point of oral tra- uh, transmission of vedic literature right uh, there's also a chapter on uh, information ecology in this book uh-huh. so he sort of addresses that which we'll come uh, later on in this book uh, but the point is that tools based on math- mathematical axioms uh, like uh, mechanical clock uh with, and then you invented something like the printing press which sort of democratized information hmm. again it's information going en masse hmm. and it can be uh, harnessed by people right and third when galileo came up with his proposition and it it shook the belief uh in what the ancestors told because what all three things did is that it questioned the uh, values or uh, questioned the stories the myths that have been told to the people over uh, centuries yeah like uh whether that myth is about the uh, exact time like even if there's an interesting uh sentence or uh, there's an interesting information that the era became so mm. much about the exactitudes that they want to find everything to be precise yeah that they even thought that it is possible to determine the exact moment of creation which <laughs> it turned out to be 9 am on october 23rd 4004 bc <laughs> so it, because they were start they started questioning the authority of i don't think any any clergy ever talked about this exact time before yeah this uh, whole set of belief came into being but you know what is especially funny in, uh, in this whole business of getting the creation date exactly right, right is that the people who were indulging in these exercises while they had a passion for exactitude and they wanted the exact time right. of creation to be uncovered they themselves were thoroughly christian in their right. world view so uh, they did a lot of uh, gymnastics and somersaults to arrive at that 4004 bc because they did not violate the biblical narrative at that time it was only later maybe a century or two later mm-hmm. that that thing completely got demolished but for them it was basically using these tools or using this new science or whatever to reaffirm their belief exactly. in the bible so they had all good intentions yeah. they were devout christians they were not uh, okay we are not blaming this was some sort of a anti christian conspiracy going on because neither newton copernicus nor galileo neither of them were atheist nor they had any modern values they all did it with with a noble intention that if we can figure out then our religion will be more what yeah, we understand yeah. as scientific or logical Yeah. and uh, to be honest the bible also talks about logic which we discussed in the last uh episode about when we discussed the book of uh, asan bagh gadhar right that uh, in christianity the truth uh, the supremacy of truth logical truth the supremacy of logical truth and they were just following that tenet only when they went ahead with this proposition so not only when the era of francis bacon and philosophers like him came which valued uh the uh quality of life the individuals individuals happiness mm. the pursuit of individuals uh, uh what do you call betterment in every domain every uh, aspect of life that it changed the entire philosophy i was recently reading this book uh, by yuval yuval mm. the homo deus i guess where he mentioned that three things that humanity used always tormented of that was famine uh, war and epidemic now these three things were very prevalent in the medieval ages at such a juncture if you give someone a comfort or some, someone comes up with a philosophy that the technology can ensure that individual can be safe from all these th- three things then that is something a good deal for anyone to take no matter how devout that person is no matter how much that person believes in his tradition and culture and that's how the technocracy the era of technocracy went ahead with Yeah and it makes perfect sense for uh, for a christian to rationalize uh, the use of technology uh, and to force fit it into his religious beliefs and it's very easy to do i mean it, it makes absolute sense uh, looking at it from as an outsider now or in the hindsight mm-hmm. uh, this is inevitable 
because it's such a self evident good that you know uh, famine war and epidemic and epidemic uh, but the funny part is that you know today all three still exist and still manifest in in ways uh, that are sometimes even more brutal than how they would in the medieval or the ancient age covid being the latest okay. example so i'll just take you all's uh, sentence itself so he says that earlier these three things used to happen out of natural causes i don't know let's assume that it, ha- it all happened due to natural causes and people think this is some kind of a wrath, wrath of god and the divine forces have uh, unleashed their anger on upon uh, poor subjects now we just blame technology for all of that so what the technocracy era did is that the divine forces were replaced by these artificial forces and some technological malfunction has happened yeah. and the pattern have gone uh, haywire haywire yeah and that's the result of these three things yeah. so basically the humanity suffered from those calamities back then they suffer it from now one may argue that people died more in those days people are dying comparatively less maybe they'll pull up some statistics because i have not done so let i'll just give it to them okay mm-hmm. but the causes have just replaced you have just replaced the causes with a new invention yeah. and you said that now we have a better understanding of the world yeah so when when this uh, technocracy and still the technocracy did not challenge the understanding of the world because scientists even in those eras uh, were believers it yeah. happened later day. it happened after the uh, after the era of technopoly yeah. which interestingly uh, 1776 juncture interest america got independence at that time adam smith wrote his uh, um, most famous work uh, in the same year and around 1850s that i guess the third chapter is when machine started develop machines were being developed to make more machines hmm it's a second or third order machines that were being developed and then the fervor of in a, make build, having inventions or uh, doing inventions came up in the american psyche and technology is that american age we can also call that what i've just read from the third chapter is basically the how america rose and took over the what entire europe has done for 3 4 centuries and took it to its logical conclusion and that is uh, precisely what technopoly is right. the absolute takeover of technology on every traditional setup be that of religion be that of family be that of state technology being the uh, that one superpower which governs all of them yeah in that <laughs> in that sense the tool using culture which is stage 1 and technopoly which is stage 3 are the stable states and technocracy is that transition between the two right. where technocracy is like almost like a spectrum uh-huh. where it starts from a tool using culture and then slowly the grip of institutions and social uh, mores and uh, c- cultural norms uh, is is weakened and the stranglehold is weakened and finally they completely give way to uh, technological advancement and technology becomes the new culture as it happened uh, like the protestant reformation would not have been possible without uh, printing press of course yes uh, it has been acknowledged by almost every historian yes. and how it altered europe we we are aware the entire modern uh, establishment or the understanding of modernity is product of that yeah and without that invention uh we would have still be seen europe in that uh era of clergy clergy dominance like yeah. the middle east uh the west asia is uh, to a good extent not uh, entirely but to a good extent it remained until 19th century okay. that it was more primarily a tool using not tool using but somewhere dwindling between the technocracy and a uh, tool using culture yeah, yeah. but the clash was very evident uh the clash was evident even in india because we have seen the clash uh, happening within the course of a decade or two like the britain british came to this country and they altered uh, every traditional setup mm. and so out of, all of a sudden we had no understanding of what was happening yeah for them it has happened over the course of century so they were better uh, equipped to actually deal with this change although they also faltered to a, a good extent uh, the movements which was against technology it happened in europe happened on a massive scale where they were fearful of losing their own jobs this is still happening when we are talking about ai there are a lot of movements to stop uh, ai from taking over certain industries because uh, it will render people jobless 
it's like a cyclical process is happening and that here comes the technophile will say that no the previous process more jobs were created and better world was created supposedly similarly if this churn also happens another better world will be created so it has just boosted their confidence because they have been able to uh, surpass one wave of luddites a second wave and third wave and they'll say that we'll yeah the march of technology is uh, uh, as we speak right. invincible correct right. and so in every phase of its uh, growth uh, there have been movements and he has also documented how many french writers right. had rallied against modernity and the newly ripe version of humanity mm-hmm. uh, and he talks about <coughs> Uh, uh the luddite movement mm-hmm. and in fact the origin of the luddite movement he says that the word luddite acquired a very negative connotation only mm-hmm. later earlier it was more about the rights of the dispossessed and the right. workers who had you know completely uh, become uh, almost like slaves right. uh, in the new technological world so uh, so luddite movement had a very uh, noble origin Uh, later on of course uh, luddites uh, tend i mean the word became associated with those who who say that you know you go back to the stone age and you don't need technology and stuff like that um, but the straw man was created of luddites yes yes like uh, the opposition was created correct. like okay you want to go back That's correct it. and he also mentions uh, you know robert owen's experimental community in scotland uh, called new lanark which was supposed to be a you know a haven for people who wanted to um stay away from the ill effects of the right. new technology uh, but that everything perished uh, and the march of technology as we know uh, continues to this day uh, the difference between uh, te- te- technocracy where he says the technocracy is a society only loosely controlled by social custom and religious tradition uh, and it is rather driven by the impulse to invent and that uh, the ideas of tool tool using cultures were designed to address questions that still lingered in a technocracy and they still believed that tools ought to be servants not masters even in a technocracy people still believed that right. tools are the servants and not masters which is what changed in when technopoly came into okay. i mean of course these are all abstract ideas there's right. no technopoly no how will come in but uh, that is how you can mark the transition right. between the two and another idea that came in uh, in the technocracy era itself which actually became the reason for uh, technopoly and that is the idea of progress right that you have to march ahead uh, you have to conquer there's a conflict with the nature that if you invent you can uh, control things which are beyond your control which is supposedly our ancestors just Uh, gave up on mm. doing uh, even uh, the era of when they ferried across the seas the european colonizers and they colonized entire races they felt they were superior because they were backed by some technological inventions mm. which made them superior among those who did not have that and this idea of progress this idea of absolute dominance uh, just added with the racial superiority notion it it was meant to give rise to a technopoly era right right which eventually happened which eventually yeah so he uh, at one point in this chapter he talks about how the narrative of the inductive uh, science mm-hmm. it takes precedence over the great narrative of genesis right and he talks in a christian context but what do you think about how uh, our own civilizational view uh you know informed by the vedas and later on the puranas most people are more familiar with the puranic uh, universe and how that has changed i mean uh, we see it happening because india is you know in parts technocracy part yeah part technopoly part tool using so also we are still we, we have the privilege of even today observing how this transition is happening in right. some pockets although it is mostly you know it is part of the global world order now but you still have parts where it has not completely made that shift so this conflict is very much alive even today mm-hmm. where people are actually trying to say that oh this they they're trying to force fit the puranic view into the scientific correct chronology and saying that no 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 actually mahabharat is so old and this ramayan is happened at this particular date 
which if we actually look at the parallels from the christian we know that it is a scientific i mean we are says. we are late to get infected with this disease of uh, exactitudes <laughs> yeah uh, probably yeah. because we are so many <laughs> we are so many yeah so <laughs> yeah so we got infected with this disease of exactitude quite late and i don't know we should <laughs> we should just take lessons from them like as i said earlier that they did it with great intentions so when a average hindu mind in today's time because he's he's dazzled with technology he dazzled with innovations and he sees that he must rationalize his belief so that he may sound uh, he may sound convincing to the person next to him without actually understanding that the myth doesn't work that way hmm. and that does some that's something with the christian world did not understand and they they paid the price for it if we can say it uh the sects that came out uh, of the orthodox christianity uh thoroughly dismantled their belief and secularized them to an extent where they are defenseless in today's time any change that happens in the global world uh, they have zero consequence on it uh, that to when at a point uh, they had the most influence across the globe i mean 6 centuries back when every other person who is even ferrying from one land to other used to write about how he has contributed so much to the uh, treasury of of the orthodox clerics and all and they used to get so, some kind of farman from them of his great endeavors and doing the cause of uh, working for the cause of the christ now we as a race have not actually got into the zone of technopoly because we have our society is still somewhere uh, dwindling between the regressive and the ortho what they call it regressive and at the juncture of regressive and progressive side but it did happen in the last 10 years last 10 20 years that we have seen with the rise of internet which has gone to exact uh, which has gone to every door step in covid times when every student is getting educated on a gadget we have seen the dominance of the technology we have seen how they are getting subservient to it and is therefore that transition will happen very swiftly because we are not the drivers of it no no yeah so the reason why we were not uh, we did not make that very clear transition obviously there were elements of technopoly already in place much earlier but uh, we have also i believe now made that transition and the reason that we made the transition late is um is slightly counterintuitive uh, i think we made the transition late because india was suffering under the nehruvian economic model mm-hmm. and therefore efficiency was the last thing on the people's mind while right. technopoly is actually about taking efficiency to every aspect of life this is what also he describes in the right. and once that happens yeah. secondly uh, tech, uh, the control of information is what technology is about okay. is how he defines how postman defines technology that how do you control information and institutions as such are also a part of that mechanism of controlling institutions of information controlling information so when uh, the internet revolution happened all such barriers were broken and today we are living in an age of not information bloom not even information glut as he calls it hmm. but a deluge a flood of information correct and so whether we like it or not we are already part of the technopoly correct uh, universe there is one thing that you mentioned about the nehru since you are suffering in the nehruvian era yeah that is an interesting point because nehru hated the word profit as we but before you make your point yeah. let me clarify yeah. that saying that we were saved from technology technopoly by the nehru by the we, nehru, are we are not endorsing <laughs> the nehru correct because people will jump and say that, no you wanted you wanted to stay at that 1% growth rate no no that's not what we are saying we are saying uh-huh. that in one of the unintended consequences of yeah. that well, we are just was, dis- yeah, we are we just, just discussing it <laughs> we are not yes, we want to tell the intellectuals of, <laughs> of twitter especially that that this is not a crit- uh, an endorsement an endorsement of, of nehru vinera yeah. or <laughs> or anyone <laughs> or there's no desire to going back <laughs> uh, especially to that era <laughs> yeah. so because if you see that nehru vinera had endorsed or had 
encouraged a very anti-American character uh, among people because obviously they were moved by the Soviet notions. Now, what is an American character? That is a very interesting subject. And he addressed it in the third chapter itself. And he said that why technopoly came into being in America only? Or let's say it came into being in America first and then to the world. And he mentions there's four reasons for it. Yeah. First is the American character. And he says that nowhere does he see any limit placed by nature to human endeavor. Mm. In his eyes, something that does not exist is something that has not been tried. Mm. That is the prevailing American sentiment. Right. That if it does, if it doesn't exist, it has not been tried. Right. If we try, we can make it happen. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons they have reached to the moon. Right. They thought that reaching moon is possible. Uh, making a man land on the moon is possible. They did it. They did it first. And nobody, no one else has been able to uh, achieve that, barring conspiracy theory aside. <laughs> <laughs> Second is the genius and audacity of American capitalist. Uh, their greatest achievement was in convincing that the countrymen, that future future need not have any connection to the past. Yeah. Now the point is that they they did not have a past. True. So the people who landed in America on the shores of America and who built their country. They were not coming from a traditional background. They had uh, no traditional, uh, what do you call that, roots to hold on to. Oh. So for them, what is the story? A story is something which they themselves will write. Yeah. And they're capitalists. They're, they're, you can call it a genius and the audacity and the courage. That they went ahead and they wrote their story. Because was, they had nothing to lose. They had nothing to lose. I, I was watching this uh, film by Martin Scorsese. Uh, it's called The Aviator. Uh, it's based on the life of an American entrepreneur, Howard Hughes. So he wanted to make a film, one of the most expensive film of that, 1929. And he had took 26 cameras and he wanted to shoot an aerial combat in mm. 1920s. Wow. He, uh, he set atop those cameras on those planes and he uh, shot over the course of two years. Uh, a couple of pilots also died while shooting. Wow. But that did not stop him from his endeavor. Uh, so whatever happened, a tragedy happened and he got bankrupt and all that. But the film actually shows that's the American character. That he's not afraid to go to any extent to make it possible what he actually thought that it can be possible. And that's actually prove, is proven. Like in uh, in the defense sector especially, especially, their success, the tremendous success in 20th century. Why they have succeeded in winning two world wars. Because they have invested, they have built their own story. Mm. And that's... That's very ingrained in their character. That's, right. that's something which can, they no one can take away from it. Right. And and that's why I say that Postman is writing this book in America. <laughs> is something is something unique in itself. <laughs> and another, it's an audacious act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Third, he says that the direct benefits of technology, the success of the twentieth century technology in providing Americans with convenience, comfort, speed, hygiene, and abundance. Mm. To every old world belief habit or tradition there was and still is a technological alternative. That Then he writes a very interesting, a very beautiful line. To prayer, the alternative is penicillin. To family roots, the alternative is mobility. To reading, the alternative is television. To restraint, the alternative is immediate gratification. To sin, the alternative is psychotherapy. To political ideology, the alternative is popular appeal established through scientific polling. That's elections. Yeah, true. So, every belief which was sacred in the old world to the ancients, there is the technology has given and generated an alternative which people think is better. Like, yeah. uh, what can save you first? A prayer or a pencil? Right. Of course, a believer will say prayer, but science yeah, demonstrates. Like, yeah. Give him a penicillin, give him any antibiotic. True. Uh, similarly, Family. When we talk about family roots, the, uh, the first uh, book that we discussed uh, in this is in that mobility. That's the answer of everything. Right. If you're suffering, if you're suffering between uh, people you're stuck with, if you're suffering in your family, if you're suffering in your community, rise up. If you rise up, your problem will be solved. The tradition, the traditional setup of a family and uh, you need not suffer there. You need not even attempt to change it. You need not even attempt to... Uh, Put an effort to make it better. No. Because the world and the market has given you ample opportunity to move out. Yeah. 
and similarly when you say the alternative uh, alternative to even political ideology or to believe in when you have given the medium of polling and now the televised debates now, now campaigns through internet we feel that we have the power we have the power to actually choose the government and influence what is going to happen across thousands of miles that belief is very strong mm. and even today uh, it's election year and we uh, <laughs> the election commission is on <laughs> on a roll to convince everyone to vote as if every uh, everybody's vote actually in has the same value it mm. has the same value on paper but the influence is not the same right. everybody acknowledges that, and that's a flaw but do you have any answer mm. so you find a better technological alternative to dismantle this technological alternative otherwise you don't have an answer and you don't get the right mm. to even question it and the fourth he said is that the ev- evolving scholarship of 20th century is something that we should uh, take note and he says that uh, as spectacular triumphs of technology mounted something else was happening old sources of belief came under siege uh, nietzsche announced that god was dead darwin didn't go as far but did make it clear that if we were children of god we had come to be so through a much longer and less dignified route than we had imagined <laughs> uh, and that in process we had picked up some strange and unse- unseemly relatives Marx argued that history had its own agenda and was taking us where it must irrespective of our wishes. Freud taught that we had no understanding of our deepest needs and could not trust our traditional ways of reasoning to uncover them. John Watson the founder of behaviorism showed that free will was an illusion and that our behavior in the end was not unlike that of pigeons. And Einstein and his colleagues told us that there was no absolute meaning of judging anything in any case; <laughs> that everything was relative. This scholarship completely shifted the way the previous generation thought. Basically, there there was a huge loss of self belief, uh-huh. and uh, technology came in to fill in the void. <clears throat> and partly, I mean, this was a uh, cycle. where technology created that loss of self belief and then mm-hmm. provided alternatives and then it went on and on and on correct um and uh, w- one you know while you were talking about point number 3 of providing convenience to americans and you talked about uh, how you know being part of a community for example ha- had its problems and you know mobility gave that answer mm-hmm. like you know all of us in our families have that one uh, uncle who was brighter than the rest and you know he just completely abandoned the old ways moved to a metropolitan early right. on in life and is perhaps doing more successfully than most of better than everyone else and he's now you know looked at with great admiration right, right? so he's earned that position right. and status um similarly you know to these days uh, it, it may not uh, strike people immediately but uh, people complain a lot about how uh, people are always engrossed in uh, whatsapp and uh, you know facebook and you know, even even when you are in, in with a bunch of friends or relatives or relatives visit you often you know people just go to their phones and start you right. know fiddling with it and there is no conversation and i've always wondered why that mm-hmm. is the case and this beautifully reflects that same uh, predicament right that to make conversation uh, and to make meaningful conversation an effort has to be put in and you have to you know uh, have a lot of things in common you have to discover each other uh, each other's problems and joys and you know partake of each other's lives so to speak and then conversation emerges on its own but when you have a technological alternative where you know there is a raging debate on something that intellectually stimulates you mm-hmm. uh it's a very easy way to get engaged in that debate correct uh, while t- making that effort to have that conversation in uh in person takes so much more effort so efficiency efficient again correct. you know efficiency comes in and you so uh, in in a, in over a course of time uh this will become the norm and that's how technology actually dictates culture it becomes the culture social media give you a community yeah 
a community for if you want even though it's a pseudo community pseudo community yeah it's it's a community it's a community because you can right. you can block people you ah. can you can decide who you want to engage with and who you don't but you can't uh you can't decide who your neighbor is going to be at least right. in the medium term i mean Correct. you can always shift out or you can make life uh-huh. impossible so for it, them it, it gave you an efficient community yeah. but technology will say that uh <laughs> like you cannot choose your neighbors yeah. uh, even that's a foreign policy was <laughs> to let you watch face time <laughs> so <laughs> so you, you can't just, help but uh, you know make these quips about uh protection <laughs> yeah <laughs> So, so you cannot change your neighbors uh, in real life. You uh, you cannot even let's say you fight among siblings. Uh, you cannot do away with your sibling. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? You find a alternative. You find a social media community group where you share a certain interest, and then you can find another group where you share a different kind of interest. And then you are part of a multiple groups at the same time, and your all of those communities are actually stronger mm. than your real community, like a football fan club. that is like a stronger community than even <laughs> uh, real life communities even based on uh, religious ties or blood ties and that's when we question why are uh, religious communities failing mm-hmm. on ground yeah, especially when we are talking about the hindu community well uh, you see it, the online hindu community it's quite strong in, in terms like it can uh, actually outrage it can generate news and it has but on ground it is not there the difference is clear because we have given a technological alternative and that can be accessed easily moving on to chapter 4 the improbable world what does he mean by improbable world so uh, basically he just compares he begins with george bernard shaw's uh, words where he says that the average person today is about as credulous as the average person in the middle ages uh, in the middle ages people believed in the authority of the religion no matter what today we believe in the authority of our science no matter what right so basically what he's saying that what do you believe in uh, depends on the source of information and information is very important like uh, for any individual to make sense of anything that happens in his life or across or around his world now what happens is that earlier people used to be dependent on institution which traditionally came into being that tradition uh, institution of family institution of religion and institution of state suddenly as you uh, mentioned that there is a flood of there is a flood of information and what does a person make sense of is completely uh, depends on what he thinks is most scientific most logical and most rational now since this was written in the again in 90s today we have the problem 10 times of it if not 100 times and we often have encountered the conversation as how to make sense mm. of information in today's day and age because as more fact checking uh, portals come away <laughs> come into existence uh, the more confused the people are <laughs> as to what is credible and what is not so the uh, entirely depends on the era of technology has deluded us uh, or deluded as it has confused us to a great extent and the average person couldn't make sense so it is being expected to actually make be more informed and he and the scientific belief is that if i get more and more and more information i'll be better equipped to make uh, better decisions in life i'll be better equipped to take uh, make my life better you know mm. as it was without having an, more of an information mm-hmm. and that is something which uh, which postman thinks is a major problem mm-hmm. yeah so i think <clears throat> why it is improbable is because um i mean I, i'm just wondering at the choice of the title the improbable world uh, is because he's talking about what lies beyond belief right and belief is certainty and uh, beyond belief is obviously it's a matter of speculation it is a matter of faith it's a matter of probability right and improbable world is that where you know the, you, you have you don't have the means to deal with things that go beyond belief right um and one of the quotes that i have noted here from the book is that technopoly deprives us of the social political historical metaphysical logical or spiritual basis for knowing what is beyond belief uh and he uh, begins his this chapter 
with with a social experiment which is mm-hmm. very funny where he goes to you know he just randomly goes to uh, people mostly his peer right. group and colleagues who are all professors and <laughs> he uses a he uses a quote here he says there is no idea so stupid that you can't find a professor who will believe it. <laughs> so so what he does is that he reports something ridiculous mm-hmm. uh to the like saying that okay ha, do you know that there is this new uh, in the new york times there is this new report which uh which says that uh, based on a study by the university of john hopkins mm-hmm. uh, eating more chocolate can make you thinner or something or make you lose weight right. or something as you know ridiculous as that and he's then he says that you know based on how i mean the the sources that you quote and things like that uh most people would believe it or, or rather not disbelieve it you know uh, th- that is how it is and um, and that fits in with the idea of what you were saying that the average person is as credulous as the average person in the middle ages just that the source of uh authority has changed right. um so yeah so that's a, it's a very interesting chapter because here now he finally after having established what uh that that transition from tool using culture to technopoly now he's talking about the consequences, consequences. and what it really mm-hmm. means to live in a technopoly i mean uh, another interesting anecdote that comes to my mind not an anecdote but something ex- you will experience if you uh, doom scroll on instagram that after every second reel you'll find one person explaining why going vegan or going not vegan is the best way <laughs> and both are giving some equally compelling arguments with uh terms as uh, scientific as it can be and you have no clue <laughs> which one is right right and both have will have countless of likes and uh, comments uh, which will just sort of add to their point or uh, uh, so and so forth both sides will have Correct. equally compelling and at the end of the day you are left with nothing now who to believe because you don't have the time or neither the expertise forget about time even if you have time you don't have the expertise or the iq to actually figure out what the truth is yeah because they both come from uh, uh, schools of authority and they have undergone certain level of training so the expertise the question is who is an expert and who who whose information is valuable is something which is up for question in today's time and that's uh, that's primarily the consequence of everybody having an access to technology and having a source that he can put out certain information and he having can, access to this uh, the whole uh, glut of information is so much noise and noise why is it called noise because it doesn't add any meaning to your life um and uh, you know here i think uh, it's a it's a good point where we can actually take a little bit of digression and uh, try to understand what this what this example of yours what it means um, in the in our context uh, uh, a lot of people complain and we discussed this in the previous uh, episode also a lot of people and a lot of uh, new neo sects uh, complain that uh, you know there are a lot of contradictions in our puranic okay. stories for example so contradictions are part of life right. uh, but unless you are living a philosophy mm. and you are practicing a religion and you are embodying those truths those truths in themselves mean nothing correct okay. like vegetarianism as a way of life yeah. is a truth having a, or consuming meat yeah. is another way of life right and both are you know both are valid in their own ways yeah. and for a vegetarianism there is a boundary that he has for himself and similarly for a non vegetarian non vegetarian he knows that this is what i do and this is the benefits it gives me mm-hmm. and there are trade offs involved right but going outside that zone of practice mm-hmm. and just commenting or speculating and uh, and you know making claims making exclusive truth claims right means nothing mm-hmm. but interestingly that this whole notion of uh making these truth, truth claims without practicing is again borrowed from the christian ideology of expansionism right. without really bothering about what it means i mean this this is part of the christian agenda in that sense mm-hmm. uh and their world view of thrusting 
alien values on other people um, because they believe that they are superior. So, I mean, just this small thing of uh, of a superiority complex, which is actually another form of inferiority complex only. Right. But this, just that small uh, instinct of superiority complex translates and makes such a huge difference to how the world operates. Right. And this is, it's amazing that way. Um, and I think that this info excess, uh, uh, informational excess is part of that scheme only. Because people now don't look at information as a way to enrich themselves or find meaning, but just to win ideological battles. And, and since you mentioned about religion, uh, we often have debates where one side will get some text, some Sanskrit shlok from some uh, Purana without ever going into uh, what actually it means or how it has been understood over the course of time through a traditional mean. No, you can just go with the translation and counter you. Correct. Now, it's your duty to explain him the entire course of uh, yeah. how traditional understanding and that's not possible that's that, that doesn't happen possible. so what happens is a clutter so even on the very basic subjects that we have often discussed in the past about uh, be that how, what is a setup what is a hindu setup uh, what are the certain traits uh, when it comes to the division of uh, society in hinduism that is very basic that that understanding is nothing complex that's how all ancient cultures have evolved but in today's time, since there's so much information that one, what do you call the one exception written in some text somewhere can be superimposed across yeah. the domain and and a person can give judgment, look, this is a contradiction and therefore it must be discarded in its yeah. entirety. Yeah. And your entire belief, your entire history can be discarded by a certain set of uh, information which, which are often misplaced. But nobody actually has the time or even the means to actually uh, clutter it out and just uh, present the right thing. Correct. Because there is no right thing. Correct. There are two perspectives and they are just battling it out. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that brings me actually to chapter 5, which is the broken defenses. And he makes a very, I mean, what we were discussing, he makes a very interesting point there also, very pertinent here, where he says that social institutions sometimes do their work simply by denying people access to information. Correct. But principally by directing how much value one must give to information itself. Exactly. Now, this is so pertinent to this whole debate of exclusion of certain communities from Vedic learning and things like that. Because that is exactly what a culture is supposed to do. Who, and we've talked about Adhikara in the past, and who has the Adhikara for a certain kind of knowledge and a certain kind of uh, learning right. depends on how you can practice it. If you can't practice it, then it is useless for you. And that is the old tool culture because <laughs> we come from that. And when we say that, uh, you know, this, when we talk about civilizational continuity and we are a civilizational right. culture or whatever, you know, we are a civilizational nation, uh, what does it even mean if you don't understand that point of view? Correct. If you don't understand tradition. And today you have a situation where people uh, market this civilizational continuity. Mm. They think that they are doing uh, some great uh, service to patriotism by saying that we are a civilizational nation. But they don't understand what that con continuity means because if they actually acknowledge that, then their whole worldview would collapse. Okay. I mean, very interesting example of denying information is, comes from this legal system. Uh, even if, even though we do not have jury in this country, we still practice this in courts. Certain evidence are admissible, certain arguments are admissible and in, inadmissible. Absolutely. And it totally depends on what the judge feels it's admissible. He has a set of rule that uh, if it fulfills X, Y, Z criteria, he'll allow it. But eventually it depends on the individual to allow it or not. Yeah. So I have to make a better sense of, a better judgment. And... That's precisely what happens in every institution. If you want an institution to function properly, it cannot run on hearsay. Yeah. It has to run on information. Any, even a platoon, if it has to strike a certain uh, location, they have to be very precise. Right. They cannot run five people thinking five different things and five people taking five different calls. Correct. Correct. It will go nowhere. Therefore, the chain of command or a kind of a... A collaboration and it is important and that's how societies work yeah. societies work on a collaborative uh, 
uh, in a collaborative framework Correct. they do not work that everybody is uh, letting Running everybody the same thing. can go on everything right the domains are very important and True. that's the filter that that domains have broken apart yeah because w- which information to admit and which information to deny mm-hmm. that is dependent on your telos the right. telos of the institution the purpose of the institution like educational institution right. he takes the example of um curriculums mm-hmm. that curriculums are designed to deny most information to students at a given stage so right. that they don't uh, get uh, uh, submerged in the deluge of information right. that is what a curriculum is and you give them only as much as they mm-hmm. can make sense of and digest so he defines technopoly as what happens to society when the defenses against information glut have broken down right. so today where when we are saying that everyone should have access to everything uh-huh. is basically uh, the logic of technopoly mm-hmm. and this is so it so beautifully comes together right. this is the logic of technopoly because there is no other logic but to use technology mm-hmm. to provide a clear direction and humane purpose to information which is generated by technology right. it's a self serving goal <laughs> <laughs> so you are already slaves of technology that way right. and Uh, and that's how what uh, like he mentions about liberal democracy it runs on this it runs on this notion that uh, individual freedom it runs on this notion of uh, having access to everything and somehow having a super ability to make sense of it and make an informed decision and rebelling against the institutions because any thing which is just being a barrier to it uh, is not letting you harness the Uh, max optimum potential of right. the individual and so, so like even the schools are although the schools institution does have its own flaw and which can be discussed it getting replaced entirely by technology hmm. when we talk about uh, youtube taking over the schooling medium that's not something which which i don't think going to help in the longer run yeah it hasn't uh if you break down the family and allow like the family uh, governs how much information is given to a child at what stage like uh, another very simple example even if you are going for movies a certain section of audience are not allowed to watch a certain kind of films because they because you you are eventually denying them right mm. you are denying them access to a certain kind of imagery what why is it because uh, because I mean, you can obviously question what it is based upon the science of it that what age uh, person can understand these things or not but eventually it is to prevent uh, the person going astray or the person or the whole structure getting broken down mm. that's what how every institution works even governments work that way and the breakdown of government like technology overpowering the government now there then comes the question that is technology empowering citizen over government or not mm. one may argue that something like wikileaks empowered a lot of people or uh, someone like uh, some someone who just lets out the information in public like the press mm. got access to technology and it can challenge any institution or at least we assume it to be challenging so then comes the classic question of what where is the line right because if you erase the line then there's a monopoly of the state mm. the monopoly of the most powerful institution which has access to everything correct and if you uh, if you give individual the complete access then there is no order right it's an orderless chaotic society yeah, yeah. and that's the classic dilemma of modern time right and uh, in chapter 3 actually uh, i don't know if we mentioned but uh, he um, traces the origin of technopoly in uh, the works of uh, this french philosopher auguste comte uh, and uh, his basic endorsement very uh, fanatical endorsement of mm-hmm. positivism Yeah. and sociology and uh, the belief he popularized the belief that what cannot be seen and measured does not exist mm-hmm. so from there comes this sociological uh, obsession with numbers and quantifying things right. like intelligence becomes iq mm-hmm. um and sin becomes social uh, deviance right. uh, evil becomes uh, psychopathology right. because obviously sin cannot be evil cannot be measured but psychopathology has a number associated with it on the rate of on a scale of 1 to 
so this um, obsession with numbers is also based on this idea of reducing the world to quantifiable uh, because items. it's easier to understand it's easier to understand and it can be uh, converted into bits of information and information is what uh, hmm. technology generates okay. like cancer like uh, in chapter 7 is related to this that uh, about uh, medical technology hmm. like why medical technology needs this information because it thinks that it can diagnose better right it can uh, make sense of why this disease what's the root cause of the disease and then go on to the extent of solving it or actually right. giving a cure or alternative to it correct uh, which again he questions that the what purpose it is it serving correct the medical technology is serving in today's time yeah so the proponent will argue that just see the development this see the falling infant mortality rate this see the life expectancy which has risen over the course of time yeah. and all of that is a product of medical technology and its advancement right had it not been possible we would have still been suffering from widespread pandemic and unstable uh family structures uh, which cannot be uh, stopped because ev- because infant mortality is so high uh, epidemics were common in today's time and this time and technology and medical inventions have definitely uh, yes so the justification is actually a technocratic justification right which he mentions in an earlier chapter on technocracy right. that the belief what forms the technocratic world view is the belief that the improvement of men's minds and the improvement of his lot are one and the same thing which okay. means that whatever you do in the social sphere the improvements that you make to social institutions mm-hmm. are the same as the improvements that you do to individuals right. it's a huge fallacy but okay. that is the belief underlying this fact and that's how uh, this um the, this argument of modern medicine also that you know uh, exter- so you measure you measure the hell out of an individual mm-hmm. and then give him technological solutions in the form of either in the form of pills or in the form of some surgical intervention right. or things like that while a more organic approach as is commonly understood would be to just improve your lifestyle you know right and <laughs> do something about it yourself but it is analogous to that mm. same situation where you can't make conversation because it's harder to do right. and it's easier to just go log into your social media account and uh-huh. you know talk to random strangers who you know nothing about but right. which gives you a sense of well being mm-hmm. right. right but uh, but they again argue the same thing that just see the statistical statistics are on our or on their side mm. on the sides of technophiles mm. that uh if in today's time a person uh, fell ill or he has to undergo a severe operation then a better informed uh, doctor can actually operate him better compared yes, of to of course no no of course no so that is what i'm saying so in uh, it is not an argument against surgery or right. taking medicine but just making the uh, point mm-hmm. that when you operate in a certain paradigm that that paradigm the rules of that paradigm are supreme so when you when you are in a technopoly when you are living inside a technopoly then everything that happens there makes sense because that is how the world is ordered that is how institutions are built now but to make a comparison with the past which is very different you need to actually take the effort of you know looking at both the things dispassionately mm. then you can make an a fair assessment as the author here is trying to do that is it the case that there is no other alternative to taking pills mm. uh especially let's say in the case of mental illnesses right like schizophrenia or depression or things like that they have not been able to provide an answer because this is at the fag end of their world view this is right. where they are disarmed this is where they don't have the answers you know the mental health issues hmm. are on account of lack of meaning and destruction of communities and people living isolated lives you cannot treat them by giving pills right. that much is obvious right but in case of other ailments uh it is more effective 
but the point to be made here is that it is not such a black and white picture and there are several blind spots that technophiles have in their uh, own uh, thinking which go unacknowledged because that is not part of culture itself because this is a culture where culture has been actually replaced by technology that's the whole point of the book correct so chapter 8 is invisible technologies and there he talks about language uh, and the fact that there is a um, identity between language and ideology he says that language itself is an ideology right and then he goes on to demonstrate that with two questions mm -hmm. uh, that are framed in a way that would give completely different outcomes and he makes this point brilliantly about right. how uh, asking or framing questions uh, has an impact on the outcome so he makes that point about language as ideology by giving two examples of how questions are framed and how that framing of questions has a direct influence on the answers you will get. Right. One is when a priest uh, who's a, who loves smoking, mm -hmm. uh, he wants to get permission for smoking while praying. Right. So he writes uh, uh, to the Pope asking if it is allowed to smoke while praying mm -hmm. and the answer he gets is no. Right. And then the other priest who also wants to do the same thing, he asks the question whether it is allowed to pray while smoking and he <laughs> gets yes. You can pray anytime. <laughs> <laughs> that is one. And the other funny example that he gives is, is of uh, a hypothetical or sort of imaginary disease that strikes a community and uh, it is, you know, when they, uh, when they fall ill, then suddenly they become immobile and paralyzed and it's difficult for the for, for people to figure out if they are still alive before burying right. them. So the question that they ask is, how do we make sure hmm. that we bury only the people who are, who are dead. dead? So in that case, you know, the solution that comes out of it is that you, in the coffin, you, um, you put, you create holes, drill holes and put a pipe out so that in the event that the person is alive, he can still breathe and you know maybe later on make some noises and you can bring him out right. and the other question is <laughs> the same question put in a different way is how can we make sure that everyone buried is dead <laughs> yeah the first question is only the dead, dead is are buried, buried. Dead buried the second question is that everyone <laughs> buried 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 get be dead. Dead. in that case they put a dagger in uh, the coffin and when they close the lid of the coffin the dagger <laughs> is there and they are dead so he says he makes these uh, these he uses these questions, funny situations, to make the point that the framing of questions and how you structure the language is uh, has an ideological bias, and that bias becomes uh, you know it 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 creates a culture of its own, right. and that is how uh, te technopoly also operates. And he, again, he gives the example of democracy where this quantification and uh, the, the obsession with putting everything, reducing everything to numbers and, um, and polling instead of having debates actually has an, how, how that works and the, how that great grand exercise in quantification leaves a great mass of people open to manipulation uh, because of uh, you know, because of the nature of right. language itself. So, uh, how does a uh, mass in a democracy actually gets manipulated by the framing of question? Like, how does it happen in real time? Yeah, so in this book, uh, uh, Postman lays out four, four points or four uh, ways in which democracy uh, subverts itself. Right. Uh, and technopoly makes that process more efficient. <laughs> Um, so the first is, of course, the same thing as the framing of questions, because you are supposed to, as a voter, you are supposed to, you, you, you are uh, ans asked questions where a yes or no response is elicited. Do you think that we should make an FDI investment or not, right? Things right. like that. Do you think that India should participate in G20 or not? Yes, no. Right. So yes, no, may the way the question is framed, as he described in the, in those funny examples, that's how public opinion is manipulated. Second is opinions are sought as if they are a thing. Mm -hmm. 
and not a process. Because opinions are basically you responding to the world around you. And they are emergent and they are organic and they are spontaneous. Right. So opinions basically are a process. An inter a social interaction where you come out with a position based on what the other person is saying, and that's how an opinion is supposed to be. But here in a democracy, a liberal democracy, it is treated as a thing in itself that you know this people believe in this as if it's a static thing right. all the time. That's not how opinions are. And you know, even nowadays we see on social media, that, oh, this guy said something five years ago, and now he has changed his opinion. Of course, he has changed. I mean, that's part of the process of intellectual growth. Hmm. Uh, while some people may use that to play their game, silly games, but that right. does not negate the fact that people change their opinions. Right? Right. The third thing he talks about is how polling ignores what people know about the subject. Uh, a typical example would be farm laws. You know, right. people may have very strong opinions about farm laws and that you know whether this is correct or not. But most people don't even know what farm laws really are. Correct. And, uh, you know, they, they don't, they, they don't, they haven't even visited a farm in the first place. They don't know what a farmer is, what kind of challenges they face. And uh, it works both ways. Uh, I'm not saying that one side is right, but I'm just giving you a general uh, example of how people comment on things that they have no idea about. But they have, uh, do have this illusion of being better informed? Yes. Uh, uh, not an illusion, at least they think it's a belief. That they it's, a certitude. it's a certitude. 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 That they, know that, they know that they've figured it out, but they don't really know it. Right? That's what Postman says here. Right. And, and the fourth, mm -hmm. which is the most important, is that it, it shifts, uh, you know, there is a shift in the locus of responsibility between political leaders to their constituents. Which is to say that political leaders say that we will do the people's bidding. But a political leader is elected and in that uh, process of election is an implicit understanding that the political leader is more capable than others. That is why he's the leader Correct. and that he will use his own judgment and wisdom to take certain decisions. Correct. While now in a democracy, because of this information glut and because of the way in which everything is falling apart, uh, political leaders tend to outsource all responsibility to the people. So in some sense, the the uh, complaint against populism mm -hmm. is just that that okay. you are doing what people are telling you you should be doing what is right. right but that these are inherent flaws in a democracy which get accentuated mm -hmm. in a technopoly right so uh, basically because the leader can easily do it because he can uh, first he has a technology to manipulate a certain crowd to believing that his idea is actually their idea yeah and he has uh, ample resources at, at his disposal to make them believe Correct. that a certain cause that he's fighting for is basically their cause. And he is the one who's taking the, uh, who's bearing the brunt of it. Right. Right? He's going to fight for it. Right. And eventually when the consequence will unfold of uh, doing certain endeavor, he can easily shift the blame that people wanted him to go ahead. Yeah. And he can easily get away with it because there's no responsibility and that's quite a uh, something that even dictators would love. Yeah, true, true, true. And and that's uh, at least the dictators get the blame. Like even <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that is, is, I guess in Sandal's book when we talked about talks about a certain person getting holding the responsibility. Okay, he was talking in the context of nepotistic, mm, mm -hmm. like a person who has been uh, born in a certain ruler right. household and he becomes the ruler. Then he has no ones to blame. Right. He can Correct. not run away. You are just destined to be. Correct. And that's what, and the person, and the, he cannot blame it on the, okay, a more meritorious guy and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The merit at gross out of the but that was in a different context. Yeah, yeah. But yes, in this case also, the, uh, thanks to technology, he can actually get away with the yeah. eventual blame Absolutely. from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, should we move on to the next chapter? Yeah. The, the mm -hmm. next chapter is, uh, is something that we all, uh, at least, uh, the masses my, in it is my favorite suffer from and that is called scientism. scientism yes yes and he says that the first and the indispensable idea is that the methods of natural sciences can be applied to the study of human behavior yeah. the idea is the backbone of much of psychology and sociology as practiced at least in america so uh, okay psychology is not part of science natural science yeah. is that what is here uh, Pointing out to be. Yes. 
Yes, he uh, is. And uh, because uh, I, I think we'll come to that later right. because but the scientism. Uh, the second idea is the social science generates specific principles which can be used to organize society on a rational and human basis. This implies that the technical means, mostly invisible technologies supervised by experts, can be designed to control human behavior and set it on proper course. The third idea is that the faith in science can serve as a comprehensive belief system that gives meaning to life as well as a sense of well-being, morality and uh, morality and mortality. mortality and even immortality. Correct. Right, correct. Yeah. So, I think, you know, this is a full-fledged attack on the social sciences, but he is obviously, you know, he's himself a social, social scientist. scientist. So, 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 so Trojan horse <laughs> in the academia, <laughs> but <laughs> and he has no qualms about it. But uh, right. what he's trying to say here is that you know uh, this obsession with reducing right. things to numbers right. and quantifying everything uh, is more is, is most pronounced in the social sciences, mm -hmm. where people want the certitude of the natural sciences in the social domain, which is impossible. Because you cannot uh, measure things like, you cannot measure feelings, you cannot measure unintended consequences, you cannot measure uh, deeply held convictions, things like that. You, you cannot measure mood swings. Basically, you are questioning the basis of pure research yeah. on religion. <laughs> like how many Indians are religious. True. It's something that you cannot measure. True, true, true. So, uh, he, he says that because that is... Uh, there is a very uh, sad and uh, a, a puerile confusion between processes and practices. Right. And he gives a very um, a, a very lucid example of the same. That the difference between a process and a practice is the difference between a blink and a wink. Right. So, a blink happens naturally. Hmm. But a wink is intentional. intentional and wherever there is intent, there things get hazy and right. cannot be simply you know, redu reduced to numbers. That is a practice. Yes, yes. Right. So, uh, one of the quotes from the book that I thought was very powerful here. The status of social science methods is further reduced by the fact that there are almost no experiments that will reveal a social science theory to be false. Right. So that's the basis. That's the basis of uh, the scientific method. Right. That uh, any theory has to be falsified. falsified. Okay. But here he says that give you know you give the example of Freud's theory where he invokes the Oedipus complex or something like the belief in God. Mm -hmm. You can never Correct. disprove it. So it is not a scientific theory at all. Right. Uh, and uh, the whole social science uh, field thrives on such, uh, you know, such uh, theories, mm -hmm. which can never be proven false. Right. So, the whole thing actually falls apart. So, they should stop, I mean, I think what he means is that they should stop having the pretension of science. He's not saying right. that it is not important. What he's doing is very important. Right. But, drop that pretense of mm -hmm. this being a hard science and an exact science. It cannot be. Uh, and if that is actually accomplished, then a lot of the ills of this world will go away. <laughs> I mean, it, there's an interesting uh, story also that Freud once sent a copy of his one of his books to Einstein, asking for his evaluation of it. Einstein replied that he thought the book exemplary, book was exemplary, but was not qualified to judge its scientific merit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book, but I cannot judge it. And Freud got angry because how can it be <laughs> exemplary if it's it is not scientific? scientific. <laughs> So, he, he makes a very funny statement in this chapter saying that social sciences often produce very commonplace conclusions, you know, obvious conclusions after a lot of theorizing and, you know, giving these convoluted arguments and finally they'll say something as obvious as a child needs mother's care. Correct. <laughs> but everyone knows. <laughs> no, there is nothing to it. Yeah. That is a need of a modern mind that he wants a, he wants a, uh, 
at least a scientific or pseudo scientific huh, that, that is what scientism is that is what scientific scientism the is the explanation that, has to sound like science it yeah, should yeah. not be stupid so that, that that's the idea no three ideas together that constitute one of the pillars of technopoly right. which is scientism the third is which you yourself said faith in science faith can serve as a com- comprehensive belief system that gives meaning to life right so that's where scientism is but it is a religion in disguise mm-hmm. it is the religion of science Right. and you apply it everywhere like god is everywhere right huh. uh, for a religious person no act uh, is devoid of some right. sense of the spiritual or or you know an inspiration from what is right what is wrong mm-hmm. you know all that uh, similarly for a for a person who believes in the religion of scientism everything has to be approved endorsed by science right and uh, that's how it is uh, and going back to the, his arguments in the earlier chapters mm-hmm. why this is the case is because of technopoly because of the uh, you know exponential growth of technology uh, intruding in every sphere of life that now you have no rituals no culture no meaning left only technology and technology as an end in itself and technology as culture so it has taken over everything and uh, that is what totalitarianism is and totalitarian technocracy is technopoly so it's it's, it's such a well written book that every chapter ties into other chapters and you know you have to read it several times to make Which those is, connections right. uh, excellent book so uh, i think we have spoken at length you, you might want to summarize the end last two chapters the last one was uh, basically a great symbol drain when he was talking about how we have made things to be frivolous hmm. and one interesting uh, idea that he proposed in this book is that he doesn't have a problem with blasphemy when it comes to the idea of blasphemy he puts it very uh, beautifully that uh, the blasphemer takes symbols as seriously as an idol hmm. uh, which is why the uh, uh, there is a which is why you have uh, certain regulations as to if you disrespect certain idols will be punished under mm. xyz section even for the flag of india if you disrespect the flag of india will be punished right but the real harm to a certain symbol comes from uh, when they when we democratize it to an extent that we have uh, we have trivialized its sacredness and he mentioned it uh, he mentions that when the martin luther's Martin Luther King's birthday or the president days is celebrated as uh, the occasion of furniture discounts hmm. that is the day when the value comes down the idea of sacredness comes down but if if i uh, join link it with the idea of technopoly in today's time with the free market and uh, where everything is up for sa- sort of a sale or everything is up for exposure the way we practice our religion itself becomes a very uh, what do you call that we are showing it to the people or we are just putting it on display hmm. Hmm. like uh, when the ram mandir inauguration was happening we had pvl pvr rainbox and offering screening along right. with right. free popcorn combos right. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are harnessing the idea of technology that you are taking devotees you are giving camera to devotees they can actually see the very sacred ritual happening right Uh, which was not accessible to masses at one point of time because the ritual used to happen behind closed doors or a very few people who have managed to reach the place can actually see it and whatever the uh, other rituals associated with it are but today the technology has empowered you that you can with the comfort of your homes you can have an access to it and why just have an access when you can have a popcorn as, as well at the same time or something yeah, i'm just yeah yeah uh, i'm not i'm just putting an example of it hmm. and and that is how we how technology has actually changed the way we are practicing our religion itself yeah and religion is something which was held in very high regard compared to uh, what i mean one can argue that it is still held in a very high regard again there are so many believers across the world but it does have an impact and it has an ecological impact yeah. it's not an additive or that earlier used to travel 500 kilometers to uh, see the temple of the deity and today you are going with a chopper there correct correct it's the entire ecology has changed yes yes it also we are talking about that ecological related to the 
इकोलॉजिकल सेंटिटी ऑफ सर्टन तीर्थ क्षेत्र दैट यू हैव चेंज द वे अ ह्यूमन अप्रोचेज हिज सेक्रेड हिज गॉड द एंटायर इक्वेशन हैज बीन चेंज एंड दैट्स दैट्स वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग दैट हैज कम अप इन दिस बुक राइट and i think the last chapter is actually very uh, you know he, he resolves it very beautifully like a beautiful music piece right you know the end of the thing gives you some sort of a coherence right uh, everywhere he's made such complex arguments that you think you know you're forced to think what exactly does he want right right uh, and uh, in the last chapter he is i i really liked it for the way in which he has resolved all these conflicts by saying that this is how i approach it right. and he brings in an element of subjectivity which is again arch enemy of technopoly subjectivity right. because there's a war on subjectivity but he brings in an uh, element of subjectivity here where he says that uh, to deal with the implications and the uh, adverse effects of technopoly uh, you must become the loving resistance fighter right right and uh, basically a technological resistance fighter maintains and this is i am quoting from the book a technological resistance fighter maintains an epistemological and psychic distance from any technology so that it always appears somewhat strange never inevitable never natural so he's not saying that you stop using your cell phones you stop using uh, you know your uh, modern gadgets but uh, maintain a psychological a psychic distance so right. that you know the traps involved in right. the usage of such and a simple example could again going back to the same thing of using um, cell phones while in a gathering i i mean personally i never do that you know if right. if there are guests at home i keep the phone away because that would be the right thing to do right but you cannot do that if you are totally unaware of the effects of technology uh-huh. on on this you if it, if it is a, very natural to you that it has to be there in my hand when i'm yeah. talking it is of course it is natural yeah, to everyone to everyone. today okay. but i'm saying that you have to have that certain psychological uh-huh. distance from it to know that this is actually detrimental to what is going on presently around Correct. me in person Correct. so so that's just a very simple example uh-huh. i'm not virtue signaling <laughs> just saying that this is a this seems to be what he is implying here ha uh-huh. that psychic distance actually meant that only that yeah. it doesn't come natural to you like yeah, yeah. so you make efforts to uh-huh. keep, it keep it at a distance correct right. it does come natural because uh-huh. you it does at least not in the psyche yeah, yeah, you yeah. understand this is True. not your natural state yeah yeah, yeah. it True. is there it is all you are using it efficiently because you want certain things to happen but uh, like it should not cause a, a panic to you if it vanishes yeah. one day Yeah, so you are like a panic was caused when people were told not to go outside during yeah. pandemic and they had no like yeah. what to do next true because we had a life outside within the home with the same people that we have been grown up we cannot survive yeah uh, there are so many sociological studies but <laughs> let's keep that aside yeah uh, but that does signify to it that it was not something people were natural very comfortable in their own habitat which they have grown up with and technology was still there technology right. was a great aid to them at that point of time because they could connect but again that uh, if you think that it is something that a person grows up with it is something that it there has to be a technological solution for everything that you feel uh, is problem or if you feel uncomfortable with then certainly that you are not in the case of uh, you are not in the league of those yeah he is mentioning at the end of the chapter yeah 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 and he divides it into two parts uh, the response to right. and he says that it's a response it's hardly a solution hmm. to the to the problem of living in a developing technopoly right. and he divides it into two parts one what the individual can do irrespective of what the culture is doing hmm. and two what the culture can do irrespective of what any individual is doing right and f- but is either of the two possible yes that that's the case that he makes and uh, you know what this reminds me of is actually something unrelated but perhaps uh, pertinent and relevant here is the evolution of the hindu religion itself right uh, we all know that you know uh, the modes of worship from the early ancient times to now have evolved uh, and they have evolved obviously as a response to the changing circumstances and environment changing society the yugas have changed and so has the 
way in which we approach divinity and the sacred. And one of the most uh, uh, obvious examples of that is the transition from a purely Vedic mm -hmm. society to uh, Puranic and Tantric forms of worship. And we all know that Tantric forms of worship are individual centric. Mm. And I think that, you know, as uh, we evolved from a tool making to a technocratic culture uh, in India, the Tantric religion evolved to give that space that he's talking about, the loving resistance fighter, because the, uh, the emphasis on individual sadhana right. in the Tantric religion is quite high paramount yeah when compared with uh, with the vedic religion uh, and in the way uh, to the to the extent that people often confuse that to be a rebellion against the vedic which it is not right. so this is because it's a totally different approach where you are preserving uh, your sanity in a in a fast changing world but i think that uh, I, I can, you know, make that uh, haughty conclusion that that I think that in the current era, I think there needs to be some more innovation to how we are now approaching an age which is so completely uh, dominated by technology. Mm -hmm. And these old questions of what the sacred sites mean, what the Punya Shetras are, right. how do we approach pilgrimage, what do we do with mm -hmm. our natural heritage, these are the questions that have to be answered in the context of right. this uh, technological dominance. And that would define uh, how a Hindu uh, practices his religion in, the, in this new okay. techno technopolic age. Right. On that note, we'll end this episode. Okay. Uh, thank you viewers for watching. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode of Bookmark. Till then, please like our video and share and subscribe to Upward. Thank you.